Chapter 15 One of our pleasantest visits was to Pierre Lachaise, the national burying ground of France, the honored resting place of some of her greatest and best children, the last home of scores of illustrious men and women who were born to no titles, but achieved fame by their own energy and their own genius. It is a solemn city of winding streets, of miniature marble temples and mansions of the dead gleaming white from out of a wilderness of foliage and fresh flowers. Not every city is so well peopled as this, or has so ample an area within its walls. Few palaces exist in any city which that are so exquisite in design, so rich in art, so costly in material, so graceful, so beautiful. We had stood in the ancient church of St. Denis, where the marble effigies of thirty generations of kings and queens lay stretched at length upon the tombs, and the sensations invoked were startling and novel. The curious armor, the obsolete costumes, the placid faces, the hands placed palm to palm in eloquent supplication. It was a vision of gray antiquity. It seemed curious enough to be standing face to face, as it were, with old Dagobert I and Clovis and Charlemagne. Those vague colossal heroes, those shadows, those myths of a thousand years ago. I touched their dust-covered faces with my finger, but Dagobert was deader than the sixteen centuries that have passed over him. Clovis slept well after his labor for Christ, and old Charlemagne went on dreaming of his paladins, of bloody Ron Cisveus, and gave me no heed. The great names of Pierre Lachaise impress one too, but differently. There the suggestion brought constantly to his mind is that this place is sacred to the nobler royalty and the royalty of heart and brain. Every faculty of mind, every noble trait of human nature, every high occupation which men engage in seems represented by a famous name. The effect is a curious medley, Davos de Messina, who wrought many a battle tragedy, and so also is Rachel, of equal renown in mimic tragedy on the stage. The Abbey Sicard sleeps here, the first great teacher of the deaf and dumb, a man whose heart went out to every unfortunate, and whose life was given to kindly offices in their service. And not far off, in repose and peace at last, lies Marshal Nye, whose stormy spirit knew no music like the bugle call to arms. The man who originated public gaslighting and that other benefactor who introduced the cultivation of the potato and thus blessed millions of his starving countrymen lie with the Prince of Massereno and with exiled queens and princes of further India, Gay Lussac the chemist, Laplace the astronomer, Leray the surgeon, De Sous the advocate, are here, and with them are Talma, Bellini, Rubini, de Balzac, Beaumarchais, Beringer, Molaire, and La Fontaine, and scores of other men whose names and whose worthy labors are as familiar in the remote by-places of civilization as are the historic deeds of the kings and princes that sleep in the marble vaults of St. Denis. But among the thousands and thousands of tombs in Pierre Lachaise there is one that no man, no woman, no youth of either sex ever passes by without stopping to examine. Every visitor has a sort of indistinct idea of the history of its dead and comprehends that homage is due there. But not one in twenty thousand remember clearly the story of that tomb and its romantic occupants. This is the grave of Abelard and Heloise, 
a grave which has been more revered, more widely known, more written and sung about, and wept over for seven hundred years than any other in Christendom, save only that of the Savior. All visitors linger pensively about it, all young people capture and carry away keepsakes and mementos of it, all Parisian youths and maidens who are disappointed in love come there to bail out when they are full of tears. Yea, many stricken lovers make pilgrimages to this shrine from distant provinces to weep and wail and grit their teeth over their heavy sorrows and to purchase the sympathies of the chastened spirits of that tomb with offerings of immortelles and budding flowers. Go when you will, you will find somebody snuffling over that tomb. Go when you will, you will find it furnished with those bouquets and immortelles. Go when you will, you will find a gravel train from Marseilles arriving to supply the deficiencies caused by memento-cabbaging vandals whose affections have miscarried. Yet who really knows the story of Abelard and Heloise, precious few people? The names are perfectly familiar to everybody, and that is about all. With infinite pains I have acquired a knowledge of that history, and I propose to narrate it here, partly for the honest information of the public, and partly to show that public that they have been wasting a good deal of marketable sentiment very unnecessarily. The Story of Abelard and Heloise Heloise was born 765 years ago. She may have had parents. There's no telling. She lived with her uncle Fulbert, a canon of the Cathedral of Paris. I do not know what a canon of a cathedral is, but that's what he was. It was nothing more than a sort of mountain howitzer, likely because they had no heavy artillery in those days. Suffice it then that Heloise lived with her uncle the howitzer and was happy. She spent most of her childhood in the convent of Argate. Never heard of Argate before, but suppose there really is such a place. She then returned to her uncle, the old gun, or son of a gun, as the case may be, and he taught her to write and speak Latin, which was a language of literature and polite society at that period. Just at this time, Pierre Abelard, who already made himself widely famous as a rhetorician, came to found a school of rhetoric in Paris. The originality of his principles, his eloquence, and his great physical strength and beauty created a profound sensation. He saw Heloise and was captivated by her blooming youth, her beauty, and her charming disposition. He wrote to her. She answered. He wrote again. She answered again. He was now in love. He longed to know her, to speak to her face to face. His school was near Fulbert's house. He asked Fulbert to allow him to call. The good old Swivel saw here a rare opportunity. His niece, whom he loved so much, would absorb knowledge from this man and would not cost him a cent. Such was Fulbert, penurious. Fulbert's first name is not mentioned by any author, which is unfortunate. However, George W. Fulbert will answer for him as well as any other. We'll let him go at that. He asked Abelard to teach her. Abelard was glad enough of the opportunity. He came often and stayed long. A letter of his shows in its very first sentence that he came under that friendly roof like a cold-hearted villain as he was, with a deliberate intention of debauching a confiding, innocent girl. This is the letter. I cannot cease to be astonished at the simplicity of Fulbert. I was as much surprised as if he had placed a lamb in the power of a hungry wolf. Helo Heloise and I, under pretext of study, gave ourselves up wholly to love and the solitude that love seeks our studies procured for us. 
Books were open before us, but we spoke oftener of love than philosophy, and kisses came more readily from our lips than words. And so, exulting over the honorable confidence, which to his degraded instinct was a ludicrous simplicity, this unmanly Abelard seduced the niece of the man whose guest he was. Paris found it out. Fulbert was told of it, told often, but refused to believe it. He could not comprehend how a man could be so depraved as to use the sacred protection and security of hospitality as a means for the commission of such a crime as that. But when he heard the rowdies in the street singing the love songs of Abelard, the Heloise, the case was too plain. Love songs come not properly within the teaching of rhetoric and philosophy. He drove Abelard from his house. Abelard returned secretly and carried Heloise away to Pelay in Brittany, his native country. Here shortly after, afterward he, she bore a son, who from his rare beauty was surnamed Astrolabe, William G. The girl's flight enraged Fulbert, and he longed for vengeance, but feared to strike lest retaliation visit Heloise, for he still loved her tenderly. At length Abelard offered to marry Heloise, but on a shameful condition that the marriage should be kept secret from the world. To that end, while her good name remained a wreck as before, his priestly reputation might be kept untarnished. It was like that, miscreant. Fulbert saw his opportunity and consented. He would see the parties married and then violate the confidence of the man who had taught him that trick. He would divulge the secret and so remove somewhat of the obloquy that attached to his niece's fame. But the niece suspected his scheme. She refused the marriage at first. She said Fulbert would betray the secret to save her, and besides, she did not wish to drag down a lover who was so gifted, so honored by the world, and who had such a splendid career before him. It was noble, self-sacrificing love, and characteristic of the pure-souled Heloise, but it was not good sense. But she was overruled, and the private marriage took place. Now for Fulbert, the heart so wounded should be healed at last, the proud spirit so tortured should find rest again, the humbled head should be lifted up once more. He proclaimed the marriage in the high places of the city, and rejoiced that dishonor had departed from his house. But lo, Abelard denied the marriage. Heloise denied it. The people, knowing the former circumstances, might have believed Fulbert had only Abelard denied it, but when the person chiefly interested, the girl herself, denied it, they laughed, despairing Fulbert to scorn. The poor canon of the Cathedral of Paris was spiked again. The last hope of repairing the wrong that had been done his house was gone. What next? Human nature suggested revenge. He compassed it. The historian says, Ruffians hired by Fulbert fell upon Abelard by night and inflicted upon him a terrible and nameless mutilation. I am seeking the last resting place of those ruffians. When I find it, I shall shed some tears on it and stack up some bouquets and immortelles and cart away from it some gravel whereby to remember that howsoever blotted by crime their lives may have been, these ruffians did one, did one just deed at any rate, albeit it was not warranted by the strict letter of the law. Eloise entered a convent and gave good-bye to the world and its pleasures for all time. For twelve years she never heard of Abelard, never even heard his name mentioned. She had become prioress of Argentel and led a life of complete seclusion. She happened one day to see a letter written by him, 
in which he narrated his own history. She cried over it and wrote him. He answered, addressing her as his sister in Christ. They continued to correspond, she in the unweighted language of unwavering affection, he in the chilly phraseology of the polished rhetorician. She poured out her heart in passionate, disjointed sentences. He replied with finished essays, divided deliberately into heads and subheads and premises and arguments. She showered upon him the tenderest epithets that love could devise. He addressed her from the north pole of his frozen heart with the, as the spouse of Christ, the abandoned villain. On account of her too easy government of her nuns, some disreputable irregularities were discovered among them, and the abbot of St. Denis broke up their, her establishment. Abelard was the official head of the monastery of St. Gildas de Ruiz at that time, and when he heard of her homeless condition, a sentiment of pity was aroused in his breast. It is a wonder that unfamiliar emotion did not blow his head off. And he placed her and her troop in the little oratory of the Paraclete, a religious establishment which he had founded. She had many privations and sufferings to undergo at first, but her worth and her gentle disposition won influential friends for her, and she built up a wealthy and flourishing nunnery. She became a great favorite with the heads of the church and also the people. Though she seldom appeared in public, she rapidly advanced in esteem and good report and in usefulness, and Abelard has rapidly lost ground. The Pope so honored her that he made her the head of her order. Abelard, a man of splendid talents and ranking as the first debater of his time, became timid, irresolute, and distrustful of his powers. He only needed a great misfortune to topple him from the high position he held in the world of intellectual excellence, and it came. Urged by kings and princes, to meet the subtle St. Bernard in debate and crush him. He stood up in the presence of a royal and an illustrious assemblage, and when his antagonist had finished, he looked about him and stammered a commencement, but his courage failed him. The cunning of his tongue was gone and his speech unspoken. He trembled and sat down, a disgraced and vanquished champion. He died a nobody and was buried at Cluny, A.D. 1144. They removed his body to the Paraclete afterwards, and when Heloise died twenty years later, they buried her with him in accordance with her last wish. He died at the ripe age of sixty-four, and she at sixty-three. After the bodies had remained entombed three hundred years, they were removed once more. They were removed again in 1800, and finally, seventeen years afterwards, they were taken up and transferred to Pierre la Chaise, where they will remain in peace and quiet until time comes for them to get up and move again. History is silent concerning the last acts of the mountain howitzer, let the world say what it will about him, I at least shall always respect the memory and sorrow for the abused trust and the broken heart and the troubled spirit of the old smooth bore. Rest and repose be his. Such is the story of Abelard and Eloise, such is the history of Lamartine has shed such cataracts of tears over. But that man never could come within the influence of a subject in the least pathetic, without overflowing his banks. He ought to be damned or levied, or should more properly say, such is the history, not as it is usually told, but as it is when stripped of the nauseous sentimentality that would enshrine for our loving worship 
a dastardly seducer like Pierre Abelard. I have not a word to say against the misused faithful girl, and would not withhold from her grave a single one of those simple tributes which blighted youths and maidens offered to her memory. But I am sorry enough that I have not time and opportunity to write four or five volumes of my opinion of her friend, the founder of the parachute, or the paraclete, or whatever it was. The tons of sentiment I have wasted on that unprincipled humbug in my ignorance. I shall throttle down my emotions hereafter about this sort of people until I have read them up and know whether they are entitled to any tearful attentions or not. I wish I had my immortals back now and that bunch of radishes. <laughs> well, in Paris, we often saw in shop windows that sign English spoken here. Just as one sees in the windows at home the sign ici un parle francais, we always invaded those places at once and invariably received the information framed in faultless French that the clerk who did the English for the establishment had just gone to dinner and would be back in an hour. Would Monsieur buy something? We wondered why those parties happened to take their dinners at such erratic and extraordinary hours, for we never called it a time when an exemplary Christian would be the least likely to be abroad on such an errand. The truth was, it was a base fraud, a snare to trap the unwary, chaff to catch fledglings with. They had no English murdering clerk. They trusted to the sign to inveigle foreigners into their lairs, and trusted their own blandishments to keep them there till they bought something. We ferreted out another French imposition, a frequent sign to the effect, All manner of American drinks artistically prepared here. We procured the services of a gentleman experienced in the nomenclature of the American bar and moved upon the works of one of these imposters. A bowing apron Frenchman skipped forward and said, Que voulez les messieurs? I do not know what que voulez les messieurs means, but such was his remark. Our general said, We will take a whiskey straight. A stare from the Frenchman. Well, if you don't know what that is, give us a champagne cocktail. A stare and a shrug. Well, then, give us a sherry cobbler. This Frenchman was checkmated. This was all Greek to him. Give us a brandy smash. The Frenchman backed away, began to back away, suspicious of the um, ominous vigor of the last order began to back away, shrugging his shoulders and spreading his hands apologetically. The general followed him up and gained a complete victory. The uneducated foreigner could not even furnish a Santa Cruz punch, an eye-opener, a stone fence, or an earthquake. It was plain that he was a wicked impostor. An acquaintance of mine said the other day that he was doubtless the only American visitor to the exposition who had had the high honor of being escorted by the Emperor's bodyguard. I said with unobtrusive frankness that I was astonished that such a long-legged, lantern-jawed, unprepossessing-looking specter as he should be singled out for a distinction like that, and asked him how it came about. He said he had attended a great military review in the Champ de Mars some time ago, and while the multitude about him was growing thicker and thicker every moment, he observed an open space inside the railing. He left his carriage and went into it. He was the only person there, and so he had plenty of room. And the situation being central, he could see all the preparations going on about the field. By and by there was a sound of music, and soon the Emperor of the French and the Emperor of Austria, escorted by the famous scent guards, entered the enclosure. 
They seemed not to observe him, but directly, in response to a sign from the commander of the guard, a young lieutenant came toward him with a file of his men, halted, raised his hand, gave the military salute, and then said in a low voice that he was sorry to have to disturb a stranger and a gentleman, but the place was sacred to royalty. Then this New Jersey phantom rose up and bowed and begged pardon, and then with the officer beside him, the file of men marched behind him, and with every mark of respect he was escorted to his carriage by the imperial sent guardes. The officer saluted again and fell back. The New Jersey sprite bowed in return and had presence of mind enough to pretend that he had simply called on a matter of private business with those emperors, and so waved them adieu and drove from the field. Imagine a poor Frenchman ignorantly intruding upon a public rostrum sacred to some sixpenny dignitary in America. The police would scare him to death first with a storm of their elegant blasphemy, and then pull him to pieces getting him away from there. We are measurably superior to the French in some things, but they are immeasurably our betters in others. Enough of Paris for the present. We have done our whole duty by it. We have seen the Tuileries, the Napoleon Column, the Madeleine, that wonder of wonders, the tomb of Napoleon, all the great churches and museums libraries, imperial palaces and sculpture, the picture galleries, the Pantheon, the Jardin des Plantes, the opera, the circus, the legislative body, the billiard rooms, the barbers, the grisettes. Ah, the grisettes! I had almost forgotten. They are another romantic fraud. They were, if you let the books of travel tell it, always so beautiful, so neat and trim, so graceful, so naive and trusting, so gentle, so winning, so faithful to their shop duties, so irresistible to buyers and their prattling importunity, so devoted to their poverty-stricken students of the Latin Quarter, so light-hearted and happy on their Sunday picnics in the suburbs, and oh, so charmingly, so delightfully immoral. Stuff! For three or four days I was constantly saying, Quick, Ferguson, is that a grisette? And he always said no. He comprehended at last that I wanted to see a grisette. Then he showed me dozens of them. They were all, they were like nearly all the Frenchmen and I ever, Frenchwomen I ever saw, homely. They had large hands, large feet, large mouths. They had pug noses as a general thing and mustaches that not even good breeding could overlook. They combed their hair straight back without parting. They were ill-shaped. They were not winning. They were not graceful. I knew by their looks that they ate garlic and onions, and lastly and finally, to my thinking, it would be base flattery to call them immoral. Aron the wench... I sorrow for the vagabond student of the Latin Quarter now. Even more formerly, I envied him. Thus topples to earth another idol of my infancy. We have seen everything, and tomorrow we go to Versailles. We shall see Paris only for a little while as we come back to take our line of march for the ship. And so I may as well bid the beautiful city a regretful farewell. We shall travel many thousands of miles after we leave here and visit many great cities, but we shall find none so enchanting as this. Some of our party have gone to England, intending to take a roundabout course and rejoin the vessel at Leghorn or Naples several weeks hence. We came near going to Geneva, but we have concluded to return to Marseille and go up through Italy from Genoa. I will conclude this chapter with a remark that I am sincerely proud to be able to make, and glad as well that my comrades cordially endorse it. To wit, 
by far the handsomest women we have seen in France, were born and reared in America. I feel now like a man who has redeemed a failing reputation and shed luster upon a dim discussion by a single just deed done at the eleventh hour. Let the curtain fall to slow music.